Welcome to The Waiting Room Revolution. Today, we talk with our friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Myers. He's a palliative care physician at Bridgepoint Health in Toronto and an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. In this episode, we talk about the easy things all of us can do right now to help prepare for future decision-making and why that's important to do. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. So Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Sien. Hello, Sammy. Thank you so much for inviting me. Hello, Jeff. Welcome. Jeff, can we start with your origin story? Why did you choose palliative care? Well, I'll, I'll tell you briefly and then, and then and yeah. see if it works out. You, you know, I, um, so as I was going through the, the third year of medical school, when you start and your clinical rotations and, and I would go into the emergency and I'd be like, eh, and I'd go into surgery and I'd be like, eh, and I'd go into the hospital and I'd be like, eh. And, and, you know, at, at the time, a good friend of mine had tested positive for HIV. And this was at a time when HIV, um, really the care for people with HIV was palliative care. And um, what I saw was um, he was treated horribly. He was treated absolutely horribly. And that to me was just such an injustice. And I had the great fortune of, um, of uh, spending some time at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver on their palliative care unit. And when I walked onto that unit, which was mostly HIV patients, it for the first time just made sense to me. Um, you know, someone doesn't go into medical school. I, I don't think, maybe now actually, but at the time you didn't go into medical school with, you know, dreams of being a palliative medicine physician. That wasn't even a thing back then. And so, you know, it, uh, but when you walk onto a unit or when you're in a context and it makes such sense to you when no one else, when, when nothing else has made sense, um, then it sure is, it's, it's the right thing. It was the right thing for me for sure. Mm -hmm. It's so true, actually, Jeff. I was just thinking, I've never thought of that, that no one really goes into medicine wanting to be a palliative care doctor. It's a conversion that happens uh, once, once you're enlightened. Um, but I think for most of us, it's because after going through all the other types of medical practice, you realize for many people, the things we do in palliative care are the reasons why we wanted to be a doctor. You're absolutely right, Sammy. And and the other thing that you realize is the, the simplicity of what's required, right? Um, not that, so, you know, I feel like I could have been a neurosurgeon, perhaps, <laughs> have the intelligence Excuse to be a me. neurosurgeon. Me too. <laughs> yeah. But I think that when, when, how gratifying it is with, uh, you know, to care for people and that when that care um, requires just such simple things that are that are the basic tenets of being a human being. Um, it, it, it's, it's astonishing to me every day um, how um, straightforward it is to care for people um, who have palliative care related needs. So I think you told me this once, but at what point did you realize that you, you your colleagues did not really understand what palliative care was and they weren't really giving it to their patients. So I don't, there wasn't a moment, but I will tell you that having worked at a regional cancer center for well over a decade, um, at, uh, you know, we had a clinic, um, an outpatient palliative care clinic in, in the within the cancer center. And there were several um, oncologists that could not look me in the eye. When I first started um, on at the cancer center, I was pretty enthusiastic. I was pretty, you know, um, uh, friendly and outgoing and and an extrovert. But these, there were three in particular. They would not look me in the eye. I at one point I actually even got down on the ground and was like, "Where are you looking? <laughs> You're talking to me because they wouldn't look me." At. And I realized that I represented their failure, and and so to actually sort of acknowledge me would mean that, um, that they had to accept this part of, of, of care of cancer patients that, um, that they equate, equated with failure. And so, so you know, there was a really concrete example of, of how um, messages are reinforced around the, the phrase palliative care. The, only, the other thing that comes to mind, Tien, is the number of times I was asked to change the name of our clinic. 
um, to change it from palliative care clinic to something else. Um, you know, that to me, whenever I, which I was asked at least once a week for 10 years, you know, that it was such a common thing. And, uh, and, and I felt really strongly about not doing that. But I think those are the experiences that made me realize that there was a ton of education to be done. Okay, following up on a couple of things, Jeff. So first of all, have things changed? Are the same oncologists or the same number of oncologists not looking you in the eyes? Have you noticed a change over a decade? You know, when you think about the greatest generation, the generation before the baby boomers, um, you know, the way, and this is a horrible overgeneralization, but the way that that generation kind of interacted with the healthcare system was kind of yes, doctor, no doctor, right? That's the way, but baby boomers are the complete opposite in that there's, they're, they're absolutely wanting information, wanting to be involved in decision-making processes. And the, so, so I think that's one of the, the, the differences in the public and in the, you know, in the, the patient populations that we're, we're serving is that, you know, this yes doctor, no doctor really lent itself to secrecy and, you know, not having conversations, but, but with baby boomers, there's a, there's a demand for it, I think in, in, in a much different way. And the other thing that I would say is that through, you know, it, by sheer volume and relentless um, education and, and um, sort of persistence that those of us that have been doing this for 25 years, um, that slowly over time, we've chipped away at, at educating our colleagues and educating us to, as to what we do and who we are. And the third piece that I think that was pivotal was back in 2010 was getting the data and the evidence on the impact of palliative care, right? Like it was, it was so um, myth shattering, I would say, not even myth busting, when we learned that, that uh, from the one particular study in the New England Journal of Medicine 10 years ago that showed people who had palliative care earlier lived longer and that the survival benefit was actually greater than some of the chemotherapeutic agents that they had for this population. So I think when we had that data, it was no longer, you couldn't refute anymore the potential benefits and you had to figure out as a system um, how to incorporate um, thoughtfully palliative care and, and uh, meeting palliative care needs of people and their families. Yeah, interesting. Interesting when you've been around long enough, like yeah. my old colleague, Jeff, <laughs> we've been around the same time it it is interesting to step back and and try to take the pulse of change and it is um refreshing to hear that for you you feel that the needle has changed a bit um I feel like it has Sammy. Yeah, yeah I do the other thing I would say really quick is that the learners you know medical students and residents as we go through they're such um, I feel like there's a different kind of, of thirst and, and respect for the field that, um, that, that wasn't there. It wasn't a field for so long, right? And now that the number of people that we have applying to get into our residency programs is astonishing to me. So I think, you know, there's been all of those change elements that, that make me feel like the, the, that the needle has moved on it. So where I would agree that baby boomers and the generations after are more information seeking and they're not just being good patients and behaving well. Um, they are more assertive, maybe, um, more empowered, maybe. They are still being met with a healthcare system that says things like, I'm sorry, we don't have a crystal ball. And so the ability for healthcare to respond to these new info seekers, these new empowered, activated patients and families, I think is still lagging because we hear a lot from patients and families that they didn't get the answers that they needed even when they asked. I, I completely agree with that, Timmy. Um, I, and I think where, where I feel encouraged though is I, I don't have to hide my name tag when I walk into a room. I my the first 15 years of my practice, I used to have to hide my name tag mm. when I would walk into a room. Mm. And and I don't do that anymore. And that mm. to me is just this, it, it tells me that I do, I no longer get an aversive type reaction from, mm. from people, or that's a much more, much less common experience. Having said that, the even 
if you're an information seeker, if it's not being provided, if information is not forthcoming, right, or if information is not being provided in a helpful and meaningful way, then there's a problem. And I do think that that's actually the biggest issue that we're facing as a system right now is, is around information sharing. So you have been teaching communication skills of how to talk about serious illness and, you know, the, how a disease unfolds. And yet it's not happening. You kind of alluded to that. So if you had an opportunity on a soapbox to tell people, what, do, what is it that they would need to know? What is the message that they're not getting? So let me tell you a story about when I first realized how important, how much of a problem we have around information and around understanding. I, I, there's, there are two things that happened uh, for me around the same time, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, and I was, again, reading sort of a study. And it was a study on the impact of decision making on substitute decision makers. So when, when people are, are seriously ill and, and are, have, for whatever reason, aren't able to make a decision, and so their family, their substitute decision maker is called on to make decisions, to measure the impact of those decisions, they could no longer use anxiety and depression scales. They had to use trauma scales. So we had to actually measure the impact using this, using trauma scales. And I just thought to myself, my God, like we're traumatizing mm -hmm. substitute decision makers in the way that we're asking them to make decisions. And I just thought to myself, you know, if my mother had to, was traumatized, like I could not stand the thought of my mother being traumatized in having to make decisions for my father. That just was unacceptable to me. As soon as I put it in, you know, this personal context of, of, of that's just not okay. And the second thing that happened around the same time was this fascinating study that looked at um, a cohort of people who were on dialysis. And they asked them what they thought the purpose of the dialysis, what the dialysis was doing. And 70%, 70% of those people on dialysis believed that it was healing their kidneys. They actually didn't appreciate, they didn't uh, appreciate or understand that the dialysis was not in any way, shape or form um, helping the kidneys. It was replacing the kidney function, but it wasn't helping. And I remember I went to, you know, the head of nephrology at the, at the hospital where I was working at the time. And I said, you know, look at this, you know, how can I help? How can we help? Because I recognize that some of our strengths as palliative care clinicians is around communication and, and communicating sensitive and difficult information. And the response that I got from him was um, not our patients. You know, not our, I, you know, that doesn't, not our patients, we, are, we do a much better job. And so I, I asked, can we repeat the study then, you know, here at, um, amongst your patients? And he said, yes. And sure enough, 65% of those people believed that, that the, did not fully appreciate that the dialysis wasn't in their kidneys. But that was three years, right? Like it took three years to do that study mm -hmm. and, and to replicate it. And to me, it, you know, it wasn't at that point about, you know, told you so it was, it was, you know, it was the frustration in that. How is it that we would need to do this for every population in every setting, just to convince our colleagues that we need to be doing a better job. So that's really why I got interested in, in communication skill development is because I thought it was an injustice that substitute decision makers would be traumatized. And I thought it was an injustice that about the number of decisions that were being made that weren't truly informed. That is so similar to my story as well, Jeff, not that this is about me, but no, this idea that billions and billions of people are making decisions like life altering decisions about tests and treatments or withdrawing treatments or being part of clinical studies and um, clinical trials. And they don't even fully understand what they're making a decision about sends shivers up my spine and was the probably the biggest reason why we started this podcast. Um, and, and then of course, throw made in there uh, and the ability for people to um, ask for made, which is not something I'm suggesting is right or wrong. But it's scary in an environment where people don't even have full understanding of their underlying condition, um, where they're at in their condition and how things are going to change. But they can um, ask for their life to be ended without full information. 
you know, it's, it is the, it, what keeps me up at night is the number of people or the number of decisions that are, are made um, uh, that a person would make and, and that are not fully informed. You know, we go through to, we go to great extents to ensure that people have proper consent for surgery, right? Like the consent form that we give, we know when we're going through school, how important that is. And yet consent for something like dialysis or um, a pacemaker or, you know, any, any sort of um, care or treatment plan for a person with ALS, you know, when you don't appreciate that your illness is not curable and it is progressive, no decision is, is, is informed and it keeps me up at night. Yeah. Same. You should call me. <laughs> Why should we both be laying in our own beds just with our eyes open, frustrated? Okay. It's true. I will text you next time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have another couple of questions. One is about your thirsty learners, your learners who you say um, give you hope because they're thirsty like no others. And they, want and need and accept all of this that we teach oh, with open arms. Um, I find the same thing, Jeff. Uh, but the sad thing that I find is that the number of years they spend uh, in medical school and then residency training, um, we have to fight to keep their spirit alive in that way. And it can be programmed out of them. Uh, all of this amazing palliative approach and palliative care philosophy and skills. Uh, it's very difficult for them to find other role models uh, in other specialties and therefore it gets diluted unless they do rotations with palliative care. Um, so it's great that we make them thirsty for it, but if they're not seeing it practiced anywhere else, it's very difficult to expect that they will graduate and still appreciate their role in a palliative approach. I fully agree, Sammy. And, and you know, the, what I, where I think the thirsty comes from, just to focus on that for a minute, is that I don't see um, in, our, in our learners the idea that death is a failure. Whereas I think, you know, it used to be much earlier, or maybe it, it, pub, in society actually, perhaps, um, but you're, you know, I don't, that's, they're not coming into their experiences where we're needing to convince them that death is not a failure, mm -hmm. necessarily, not, not necessarily a failure. Um, what, what I do think is important and to pick up on what you said is, is modeling is, is that we actually absolutely professionalize the empathy and humanity out of our learners as they go through. And there's really clear um, evidence you know, that tracks the, the decrease over time, year by year, um, as you go through the training. And I think the only way to combat that, as you, as you say, is through modeling um, of their, from their colleagues, from their teachers, from their mentors, from their home uh, specialty. And I think that that, um, that I would say is, is the thing that I'm, I'm most curious about right now and how we, how do we shift the tide in that? Um, because it's very, coming back to those oncologists that I was telling you about um, at the cancer center who wouldn't look me in the eye. It's very difficult to, to get them to change their behavior around, um, around what they feel about palliative care, but it is actually easier to change their behavior around being a better teacher. And so what motivates, what motivates our colleagues is wanting to teach well. And so, so that I think might be one of the, the, the ways in is to, is to figure out how to leverage the fact that they're teachers and they really value being a strong teacher. You mentioned the study, the Temel study yeah. that proved that palliative care makes people's quality of life better and can also increase their survival time in cancer, lung cancer patients. It was this, um, pivotal article that proved that earlier palliative care or palliative care in the last three months, was it? From the time of diagnosis, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So palliative care made a difference in these ways. One of the things about that article that hmm. I think sends the wrong message is that the palliative care is delivered by a palliative care specialty team. It's 
the palliative approach that makes a difference and doesn't necessarily have to be delivered by a palliative care doctor or nurse. It can be delivered by an oncologist, um, delivered by oncology nurses, using the palliative care team as needed for consultation, but they themselves can, just like we do, provide a palliative approach. You know, I remember when the study came out um, because I was I was so interested what actually happened in those in the what did the palliative care clinicians do, and you know, I, luckily they did all kinds of sub analyses and and had videotaped and audio taped a bunch of interactions, and and really when you when you pared it down to what happened during those clinic discussions with the palliative care clinicians. It was the very basic things. It was, you know, ensuring appropriate illness understanding, checking in with the caregivers to see how the caregiver was doing and, and their level of resilience. It was, um, you know, talking about the future um, in a way that was individualized, in a way that was comfortable for the person um, that uh, that they were speaking to, and 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 you're absolutely right. I think the vast majority of the palliative care that people need who have a serious illness and because it's not just cancer right it's mm -hmm. any person that has any serious illness the vast majority of those people the palliative care needs that they have can be met by their by their cardiology team or their neurology team or their ALS team there are a, a you know a an important percentage of people that have a complexity of their needs where I do think there's a role for for specialty palliative care and and that's the model that would be ideal. But unless we actually um, think about our teams providing that palliative care, and the thing is, I mean, they do, that's what they're, they're doing it right now. They just don't necessarily call it that, right? Mm -hmm. And so my struggle has been, you know, do we get them to call it that? Or do we actually just try and improve that, you know, give them confidence around their skills, skill set mm -hmm. with that. But I think, you know, it was a catch-22 that the that the Temel study, because you almost had to have the data in order to move the field forward. But at the same time in doing so, you were going to set us backwards in terms of how to actually move, get things to move forward in a, in a meaningful way, because there's only a few of us to go around. I agree with you. It's just good care that we share. <laughs> As all nurses and doctors and family members together, we just provide the care that's needed that has to balance hope and the reality of the situation. And That's we right. do that along the entire illness trajectory. So you're right, if we call it a palliative approach, we might be in the same situation we are way down at end of life, calling ourselves palliative care specialists. So what do you think? What do you do, Jeff? So I wonder if it's about educating the public. I, I, like, I think that that's, I think that the idea for your podcast was perfectly timed and, and is so well executed because I do think that um, trying to change the behavior of our colleagues is going to be tricky. I think trying to shape and mold the, the behavior of our trainees and our learners has become um, a, a really enjoyable aspect of, of, of our jobs. But I think if we, if we are able to effectively educate the public, um, and so you're, you're right about coming back to your earlier question around, you know, People, our colleagues have to be willing to actually give or share information when they have it. Um, I do think it comes back to an activated, um, you know, public and, and people that are actually advocating for, for their family members. There were so many in your first season of um, caregivers and, and people that were, that shared their stories that were just so wonderfully inspiring. And I think that is how you actually move things forward and change is, is by stories of people who have gone through this and sharing them broadly. Mm -hmm. I know that's not very, I know that's sort of vague and non-specific, but it's the only thing I'm hopeful for, to be honest with you, Sammy. Mm -hmm. are, are there particular keys in our podcast that really jump out to you? The ones that jump out the most for me, the first one is very much walk two roads. Um, the way that I, when I, when I talk to, to patients and families about this, people about this, the way I've always sort of framed it is that, you know, human beings have the capacity to be both um, optimistic and hopeful and realistic and practical at the exact same moment. You don't have to choose one or the other. Mm -hmm. And, and there are moments where, you know, I just ask permission 
um, from the person, can we just park optimism just for a moment? Because I need to talk to you about this, 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 this sort of practical realistic part of things too. And we'll come back to this. And so for people that are really, that we're afraid that we're gonna take hope away, right? Just actually reassuring them that we just need to park it for a moment is the way to, to I've been, I found is a, a way, a strategy for, for being able to talk about some of the more difficult things. And people are willing to do that. There's a willingness to do that. But I think first and foremost, just being really um, forward about saying, you can be both of these things at the same time. You don't have to be one or the other. Um, that really resonated for me. So walk two roads, you know, was great. It was, I think, wonderful for that. And then, you know, for me, <clears throat> given the, the, the focus that I have on, on illness understanding and people really educating themselves, zoom out is, is, you know, was the, the key that stood out for me the most because, <clears throat> you know, it's such a perfect analogy to think about, you know, the forest actually and, and being able to zoom out and see the forest and as opposed to you know each each you know leaf on each tree which is what we get so accustomed to so the those are the two keys that resonated the most for me mm -hmm. I guess you know actually I have to say but the because I am still so impacted by caregivers being traumatized you, you know the ripple effects as well and the parallel journey that families are on um, was the other key that really resonated. Mm -hmm. That's three out of seven. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but those are, it's true. I actually prepared for that because I was waiting for that question. I think I'm just struck because I'm trying to get Jeff to be more provocative because I know he is. And I don't know if you've just been beaten down or... <laughs> you're being nicey nicey well, tell or, me what you mean by more provocative or safe <clears throat> I don't know you know what you strike you have always struck me as yeah. the kind of person who tells it like it is in, in the yeah. most likable way like you have this beautiful um art to just like you said like you're you're funny and at the same and you can be um self-deprecating and uh just very honest and raw and you and I both know there's a lot broken um yeah there's a lot yeah. broken in healthcare. there's a lot broken within our own specialty you know yeah. so so I'm glad you said thank you for saying for saying that Sammy the I I think if I weren't um if I weren't optimistic I don't know that I could do the work, hmm. right? Like, so I'll give you an example. You know, I, now my, the clinical setting that I work in currently is a palliative care unit. And so people need to be literally at the very end of life to come into the palliative care unit, right? And they are being admitted for their final days or final hours, even in that point. And there's still about a third of, our, of the patients that I admit that don't actually understand what a palliative care unit is and that they're being admitted to a palliative care unit. And that's despite palliative care teams having cared for them, you know, prior to coming in. So I have two choices. And in, in when I think about that, I can become so frustrated, right? And so defeated by it all. What, am, am I not allowed to say that? No, you can. We're laughing. Yeah, we're laughing because that's how I, we started. I yeah, right. Like I can be. I that I I have a choice in that moment. I can I can be angry at my colleague who sent this person over. Right. Who who and and how could it possibly be that that this person doesn't have an understanding? Or what I did do was I spent a month at our big referring hospital. Right. I went into to spent a month last year during COVID. Um, at the, the hospital where we get the majority of our referrals, because I thought to myself, I'm going to help, you know, these folks to, to better explain what a palliative care unit is. And I realized how chaotic the acute care hospital environment is, how completely um, um, not well set up it is for any kind of meaningful conversation. And, and it ended up being such a massive learning experience for me around mm -hmm. the conditions that our colleagues are working in and the pace and the chaos that is in a hospitalization. And I realized, you know, no wonder, no wonder 
you know, conversations aren't happening. And so, you know, for me, then it becomes about what can we do in, in family physicians um, offices? What can we do in primary care settings? What can we do in, in the public to the best that we can um, is increase, in, increase the comfort that people have with having these discussions in the first place, because I don't know that we're going to actually make hospitals any less chaotic. But, you know, it is true. Like we beat our heads against uh, the wall. We're like a fly on a window, whatever euphemism you want, trying to change the culture of health healthcare and wondering why aren't our colleagues able to take the time to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and at some point, I guess you do have to pivot. You have to say, okay, yeah. they're really busy. They're doing what they do best. And maybe they're not the answer. Um, and maybe for me, Sammy, I should stop blaming them um, and look for other opportunities like we did with the podcast. Um, mm. Maybe that is the light bulb. Maybe it's like we're looking in the wrong places for change to happen right now. <laughs> well, but I think it's exactly what you're doing with the podcast, right? Yeah. You're looking for change to happen in a different modality, in yeah. a different framework. And and. And so you, you're, you've actually made that leap probably long before I did. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that our system is broken. And having done this for 25 years, what I'm interested in moving forward is finding the, the one thing that I might actually be able to make a measurable difference in and, and something tangible, something actually meaningful. Because I've spent the last 25 years and it's no better. It's no better. But I won't spend the next 10 years um trying to figure you, you know like i'm i i'm so committed to communication skills and to actually developing something that um that is that changes behavior of clinicians that is what i will do for the next 10 years is figure that out i was just going to ask you so what is that jeff so where are you going to focus in the next 10 years so you know there's lots of there's there's lots of um, acronyms and, and words that are thrown around. And I know CN has called it alphabet soup, right? But advanced care planning and um, these terms that are, that, are, that are used sort of all over the place and, and quite honestly, not well understood. And, and for me, where what I think of is how can we better prepare people and their substitute decision makers for decision making? How can we better prepare them? That to me is, is what the focus of my, the rest of my career is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are, so there's, there's two different groups of people. There's people that are healthy, that are walking around um, and not really thinking about illness. And any, any one of the three of us could have a stroke at, when, we, when we're going home today, right? It is my responsibility to make sure that my spouse is prepared for decision-making. Today, like he actually needs to be prepared for decision making today. And I have that responsibility to do that, right? And so what does that mean? How do I prepare someone for decision making who when I'm not ill? The 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 key to the the key to that is I need to be clear about what the image of life is that I would consider to be unacceptable, that I would consider to be intolerable. What's the image? What's the picture of life? that's not okay. Now it's hypothetical, right? I, I get that it's hypothetical, but if I've had a stroke, right? And there and there needs to be neuro, there might be neurosurgery as an option. The image of the likely outcome, right? Is what we as a system need to be painting for our, my spouse so that he has something to compare to because he has the image of what's acceptable and, uh, or what's tolerable to me, right? So that he can compare those two images. So. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about communication skills is that as clinicians, we do a better job at not prognosis or survival estimate, but what does life look like? What, what's, the, what's life going to look like for this person? Mm -hmm. because, because a person who's making decisions, they can do something with that information if they also have an image to compare it to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I, when I think of communication skills, I think of them in, in, in two different ways. How do we prepare people and their decision makers for decision making? And how do we prepare our clinical colleagues for, for 
giving the kind of information that creates a picture for them and um, a meaningful picture for them. Mm-hmm. I won't say mm-hmm. accurate, right? Mm-hmm. But I'll say a meaningful picture for them. Those are, that's, that's really where I, what I would say is kind of conceptually what, what we need to be doing differently from a communication skills perspective. Or multiple pictures for someone like your spouse, like, okay, if this road happens, this is what life is going to look like for Jeff. But I also need you to know that if this road happens, so it's painting multiple roads so that someone like your spouse can, can then know what to choose. Oh, Jeff would like that road and not that road. And I think what's really important, what you said there is that it's choosing a road, it's choosing a path, it's choosing an image. It's not choosing specific treatments. Yeah. As soon as we start talking about what we want or not want or what preferences are for treatments, we're, we're done. Because that's not what, that's not how people think about the world. That's not how people go around the world is thinking about mechanical ventilation or dialysis. No, what they think about is what they value in, in life and what's, what, what's the image of life that is important to them. What are the things? Yeah. I'll never forget when my husband and I went to go see a lawyer. I don't know. It was like, um, I don't know, 10 years ago. You're, is your husband a doctor, Sammy? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we went to see a lawyer to do our will. And, um, you know, the lawyer then asks, um, okay, now I'm going to go into another section here, want to know, okay, your advanced directives, and I'm writing them all down and making them concrete. Okay, so he asks Mitchell, um, okay, do you want a feeding tube in the future? And so Mitchell goes, "Uh, no. And do you want uh, this, that, or the other thing? Mitchell's answering every question, you know, yes or no, black or white, you know, no. No, 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 no. And then of course he asked me, do you want a feeding too? And guess what I said, Jeff, of course. It, it depends. Right. <laughs> and everything he asked me, he, he said to me, no, that you can't say that. You have to say yes or no. That's what my form is, yes or no. And I said, but it depends. And um, you know, I, uh, if one day I need a feeding tube, I think it's more important for my husband to know, you know, will this feeding tube allow me to still live at home with my family? Will this feeding tube allow me to still have a sense of control and be independent? Like, could you write that down? I'm really independent and I'm, I really am a control freak and I really want to spend as much time with my, no, he said, that's not what's on here. Do you want a feeding tube? And Mitchell's like, oh, why do you have to be so difficult all the time, Sammy? Just answer her yes or no. She wants one. Just put she wants one. <laughs> but it was torture. <laughs> you know, so, and, and so here's the example. Oh, I'm getting of- a feeding tube, whether I like it or not. Apparently, <laughs> that decision has been, the box has been checked. Yeah. Right? The tick box has been ticked. <laughs> so, you know, but. But that's you and your husband who are both physicians and and you can wrap your heads around what these things are. You know who I worry about? I worry about, you know, the 70 year old woman whose husband has said to her, um, don't put me on machines. Do not put me on machines. And then six months later, they're in eMERGE because he's got a pneumonia and he's confused and he can't make decisions. And the eMERGE doctor says to her, we need to put him on machines just for a day or two, right? That's why we're traumatizing people because what she has, right? That woman, what she has is her husband in her ear saying, do not put me on machines. But but because we are not giving context when we're having these discussions with people, then then they don't know what to do with the information. And that's how we're traumatizing people. So if we do a better job at saying, actually, why? Why don't you want to be on machines? What is it about machines? What's what's the what image comes to mind when you're when you think about machines? What is it that you're wanting to avoid? What state do you not want to be in that you're associating with machines? Those are the that's the information that's mm-hmm. actually helpful for people. You talk a lot about values mm-hmm. and spending the time to elicit people's values because once that is very clear, all these other decisions. Uh, you know, that context is there for them to make better decisions or to feel better, more comfortable with that. And I, and I think about how rarely in medicine, we have time to talk about our values and our preferences. Well, I think the word preferences is tricky because preferences in clinical settings, we often hear the word preferences and it's preference for 
a specific treatment is most often. So I try and avoid the word preferences. And I'll give you an example of, of, of value. So my my dad died when I was 25. So so you know 25 30 year, or 25 years ago, and and so it's and I'm an only child. So it's just me and my mom. And uh, she lives in Calgary. She's 75, and she. Um, uh, is well, I would say, you know, but she's starting to have a few things happen. And so she, I was telling her about uh, the advanced care planning um, sort of interest of mine. And she said to me, uh, well, let's have an advanced care planning conversation right now. And I said, okay. And, and, you know, my question to her was exactly that was, was, you know, what's important to you in life? And, and, you know, paint me the picture of life that is not acceptable to you. And, and in doing so, what my mom loves and what she, the most important things to her were being able to talk to me and my spouse. And, and um, you know, unfortunately, although this woman was put on this earth to be a grandmother, um, I don't have any kids. And so our dog Hunter has become, you know, the, the proxy for, for her grandchild. And she said, and if I can't, um, you know, pet and 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 get kisses from hunter she's like there there's no point she's like if i can't do that now that's how my mom feels today that is an expression of a, of a person's values right but i now have a picture of what life would need to be in order for me to make certain decisions should she not be able to right now that's iterative as she ages that might change there might be there might be different um, we're adaptable as human beings. And so there might be different thing, different images that are all of a sudden, okay, she could maybe see things, but that's to, to, um, to Sammy's point around, well, it depends about the feeding tube because it, it's going to be a very contextual thing. So, you know, the example that I would have is, is my mother and, and just those very simple questions around, you know, what is important to you because that's a manifestation of a person's values. Mm, okay. I think I get it, Jeff. Like many people think the discussion we are having is an advanced care plan. Like, do you want to be on a ventilator? Do you want to do not resuscitate or not? And making a decision. But I think what you're saying is that it's not really about a treatment preference. The conversations we should be having are about values, like what's important to us in our lives. And I think I hear you saying we should be thinking about not just something like our family is important to us, but what about being with your family or what about interacting with them is important to you, for instance? And so that's like more nuanced, maybe a level or two deeper, but it's not scary and it's not impossible. I guess I'm just not so sure that people realize that we have to be so explicit about it, you know, me included. <laughs> Let me ask one more question. So I have a question for you both. Just one, it's a really quick question. Yeah. So it's a hypothetical. Let's say you just get diagnosed with a neurologic disease, a neurodegenerative disease that progresses yeah. over time. And there's a medication that will extend your life, but you will experience a 30% reduction in cognition. Would you take the medication? Well, how much longer? How much more life do I get? Without, without the medication, you will progress quickly. So it extends it reasonably, but you will lose 30% reduction or 30% of your cognition. Would you take it? Initially, I was going to say no, but it, if, if I could live longer, I could maybe give up 30%. And, and, but if, I, if it gave me like 10 more years, I'd be like, yeah, I think I would take okay. it. Okay, Sammy? If it gave me one more year, I'd be like, no. My answer would be that I would probably discuss this with my family and see what they think as well. And we would make a family decision about- Fair whether, enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But, but I'm asking you right now, if you had to make a decision right now, yeah, no, I would say that I would be uncomfortable losing any of my faculties. Right. So, so there, therein lies a wonderful manifestation of, of values in both of your responses, right? In that, in that, that's what's important to you. That's how you get information that 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 can be meaningful and applicable to decision making. Can I tell you guys something? Yeah. I'm going to tell you what's important to me just so we have it on record. Okay. Okay. It's important to me to be independent and I don't want to be a burden on my family. I don't want, I want them to experience caring for me because I think that's an important life event, but not too long. I don't want 
that feeling like a burden would be a big problem for me being able to communicate like I'm a talker I don't know if you guys know that if I wasn't able to talk or participate in communication it would be a big struggle for me I think I want to be at home I don't want to be a spectacle I don't want to be in a hospital bed somewhere um you know I I need to be at home and in the privacy of my family taking care of me but not too long I don't want to linger I don't want to linger is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Because inherent under every single one of those, Sammy, is a specific value. So when we're talking about values-based conversations, this is the information that's helpful for people. Not so much the, it's the fact that you don't want to be a burden. And what I would suggest is to your family being clear about what that looks like. What's the image, right? Like where's, what's the image of, of, of being a burden? Because that's what differs for every person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Look, we've got a PhD researcher, two palliative care doctors, and it, it, it's not so straightforward. It's not it? straightforward. It's not. No. And it's not straightforward. Yeah. So from a research perspective, it, you know, there have been a lot of programs that have focused around communication training around serious illness. And in fact, there's a lot of training that focuses on using frameworks and mnemonic devices and scripts as a way to make it easier uh, to do this better. And the scripts are very popular because they're quick and easy to do and teach. But I'm curious, like, what is the drawback of that, in your opinion? You know, in some ways, what you're asking is, how do we bring humanity back into medicine? Right. Or how do we bring humanity into the into into clinical care? And because that's really what needs to happen. I think that the frameworks and the scripts have gotten people's attention and have brought an awareness to something like the serious illness and conversations and communication around serious illness is something that's important. I think that's the role that I see for scripts, how we leverage that into into education that actually changes behavior and impacts outcomes. I think that's the big question that we have that we're facing as a system right now. Mm -hmm. Love it. And, I, and if, I, if there's one thing that I would say, maybe I would appeal to, to any clinician that's listening. And I know that, that I think it's wonderful that you know, this is targeting the public. For any clinician that's listening though, if a person asks you if they're dying, it's okay to say yes. That's, I think, the, I just had this image of people asking us very direct questions, never answer direct question with the direct answer. I always ask with 14 more, answer with 14 more questions. Why is it that you're asking me about whether or not you're dying? What does your gut tell you? What do you think is happening? What do you, is going on? But also sometimes at the end of the day, it's about just being directly honest as well and saying, yes, that's what's happening. So Jeff, any final thoughts for us? I have to say one more thing. <laughs> Yeah. The consequence of not having these conversations is, you know, cut to 10 years from now when you're, when you're, when your spouse is needing to make decisions and they're traumatized. Yeah. So, so really that is the way to actually get over the discomfort for having this conversation yeah. is the, the idea of being a burden 10 years from now, because you haven't. Yeah. The value in putting out there examples of what advanced care planning conversations are is unbelievably huge. Yeah. And I should have actually brought it up at the beginning. Jeff, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Thank today. you guys. Yeah, that was really fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, to listen to our first season about the seven keys and to learn more. The podcast is produced and edited by me and Kayla McMillan. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast help us get the word out.